Any questions? Actually, we'll just uh, load up Slido as well. We've That's got load up Slido. Come in. Because yeah. all the questions are there. And we've got a couple of roaming microphones. So Jill, my colleague Jill Sears, might lead up with any questions from the floor. And I'll just get this up. So that's the uh, slide if you're online, Q662. Yeah, it's running out of Yeah, Yep. Hello. Hello, my name is Hannah. I was interested in that slide, look, I was interested in the whole thing, lots of questions and things no doubt will come up. But I've got one about the rise of populism. Your first slide about immigration, uh, poor people, the sort of people Trump got to, basically, who had lost their jobs. That sort of made sense. The other slide about, well, you know, you can think about populism uh, from you know, looking at it through a different lens and, and, and the rich wanting to hold power. But I still think that the other one underpins, you know, they learn from you know, the, the sort of first form of populism, and they think, you know, we could, we could work this baby, we could make it work. You know, here's, here's a formula so that, you know, it is certain sections of the population that would, you know, would perversely promote populism. So I don't think that second one really holds that way unless you have the first one. You know what well, I mean? they're expert marketers, that's the thing. That's the whole point of populism is they're popular, right? And so there's so many different segments of the of the market or the population that you can appeal to. And you know, you do need to, to have um, uh, poverty and disadvantage people to appeal to appeal to. You need that because that also drives um, you know, we used to have the term the worried well, yeah? This this drives the worried rich because they see that some people are. Uh, are suffering on the margins of society, and so they become scared of, of um, losing everything, of drops and falls. So yes, you do need, absolutely, you need inequality, um, you need people locked out of the political process, and that creates um, various fears and anxieties. You know, one is, you know, who can we scapegoat um, to, you know, you know, if I'm poor and hard done by, who can I scapegoat, and how does how do people like Trump feed into those racist discourses of the people that are now scapegoat? And it also creates fear among the yeah, relatively wealthy about um, them losing everything because they, they know that's what's happening. Inequality is increasing, they can see that across the train tracks, they can see what's happening. So yes, it's a it's a problem, it's a deficit based, problem based sales pitch and it works at various levels. You can go to Slido whenever you like. Okay, well, actually I might have one question for you. Um, besides the Slido one that's come up. Um, the Scanlon Foundation, what I find really interesting is that um, you know when you talk about figures around 80 to 85 percent are really happy around um, how diverse our society is and you know living in social cohesion, but then actually to actually do something is a whole different ball game to try and achieve um, equality. Um, yes. So I was just thinking why, is it just the lack of will or what is that particular, is it complacency, is it something more, why we can't bridge that gap between actually liking how we live and actually trying to achieve uh, equity or equality? equality so. Well I think it comes down to uh, more marketing. So that's why I talk so much about different ways of conceptualising equity and inequalities because a lot of people have a certain um, idea about uh, how our society is based on merit and, and uh, hard work and the lucky country and all the things that you said that your father talked about, you know, people can get ahead, the yard and the job and all that stuff. And so when you have that, that's the underlying framework, the framing of the issue and the, and the value system that people are basing it on so that 
you know, people can be happy with diversity and multiculturalism, but that doesn't mean that they're interested in racial equity or ethnic mm. equality, because they're just coming from a very individualistic place, really. And, and um, people think that they achieve because of their efforts. Um, they don't consider the luck factor. They don't consider intergenerational amenities <laughs> that accrue in various ways. And so that willingness to act is not so much just a kind of um, sense of impotence or a kind of inertia of um, laziness, it's actually based on the value systems. So we need to change people's understandings of how societies work and what it means to be unemployed, why there are unemployed people, you know. Um, what is the impact of, you know, crushing credit card debt on people? Why do we have credit card interest rates at this number? You know, there's lots of questions to ask about the way things work that are the very antithesis of the populist uh, leaders talk, you know, that, that the simple story of good and bad, of um, truth and falsity, of kind of um, um, heroes and villains. This is the, these are the kind of tropes that, that fly all around us all the time, but they, they just create a kind of um, comfort with the status quo. And so, yeah, it's fine to have diverse people, but as long as they don't have any ideas about doing things any differently, that's the problem. And that might lead to the top question up here that Peter Slatin wrote an article recently, Forbes around the trouble with inclusion, and talked about people with diverse backgrounds being locked out, being I work, like having a bouncer at the door. Now, this is a kind of an old concept. Um, you look at Aboriginal communities, you look at LGBTIQ, people with disability. So, how do we then look at fixing that? If, and a lot of DNI practitioners in the room probably observe the same similar thing, trend. Mm. Well, that's a good question. I guess. Um, it's an opportunity to ask those questions about what, you know, what... You have to understand why it happens, you know, why are people being locked out? Um, maybe they're coming in, revolving the doors and leaving quickly. You know, what is it about... What is it that organisations are looking for, anyway, from the diversity and inclusion work? You know, do they... Um, they want real change? Are they just window dressing for some reason? Um, what is the work of DNI? What are the values behind it? How is how are people? You know, is there just racism in organisations that are keeping people out, or is there something more that perhaps diverse ways of looking at the world? Are, uh, uh, and people are thinking, you know, that this this that the actual work of DNI is not really something that they find meaningful enough. So there's all the things you do. You think about. Um, just need information from people. To know that there's exclusion is one thing, but how the system works is really important. So what are the values, the cultures, the type of work? Um, yeah, is it just is it something that's just basically about uh, discrimination, or is there a deeper problem to do with um, the uh, embeddedness, really, of DNI work within organisations? That's, that's how I would think about it. I think that the, the reasons probably vary depending on um, the particular sector and organisation and even nation that you're, you're, you're considering. Yeah. Walter? Hi. Um, I think many people would, would agree that Australia is one of the more successful multicultural success stories around the world. Um, certainly in the community level, um, multiculturalism is a fact. But our Australian institutions remain stubbornly monocultural. How do we encourage uh, these two to develop this mutuality that I mentioned earlier? Mm. Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, I think it is something that needs to be encouraged. I don't think we, we're waiting for a kind of um, a catch up period at all. I think that we, uh, yeah, we need to ask these questions in a way that's challenging. So. Who's in power? Um, how are people um, achieving leadership roles within organisations? Is there a problem with the, the networks? Are the networks of recruitment not diverse enough? Uh, yeah, where does the power where does the power sit, and where are opportunities to break into the ranks of these these they're very monocultural? Yeah, there's parliament. There's um, stock exchange sort of stuff, there's major businesses and corporations. 
And so I think we need to really um, take a power lens to it. Yeah. Where, where can we create powerful opportunities? And some of that might be through creating um, different new uh, opportunities for work, different new organisations um, that compete with existing places where there's no opportunity for change. But part of it is, you know, what are the levers within organisations? Some of them are to do with economics, you know, what's the benefit of multiculturalism? There's a great deal of evidence on the benefits of diversity in organisations for creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship. That's part of it, uh, that we can try and sell people. Uh, but other parts of it is just really, um, yeah, finding, finding those gaps where the, the kind of um, the lockout doesn't quite work as well as it should. We have about three quick questions. questions. Yeah, I think um, Erin, do you want to go first? Yeah. Hello, Ian. Um, um, I've had a couple of people tell me that there's some study that has found that you know Australia is just like a real, really out there as being the most individualistic culture and society. Uh, you know, very poorly versed in any kind of collective notions of society and then so how does that playing out in our difficulties um, with diversity and inclusion? Yeah, yeah. Is that your question on slide? Yeah. It's very similar. The question on the second question, how do we instill empathy, compassion and concern in individuals in an ever-growing individualistic world as disparity in wealth is increasing? Yeah, so it's the same. I think individualism as I was alluding to before about ideas of merit and, and um, hard work and all that sort of stuff. It's enormous, it's an enormous problem and um, it underpins a lot of the issues that we have in society. So I think um, we need to develop, and you know, just the way to do it is just to go out and do it. You know, what can you create in sense, what, how can you create a sense of community um, that's beyond individualism? So that's in your workplace, uh, in your communities, in your recreation, in your family, and among your family and friends. It's the way that we even set up neighbourhoods. You know, there's increasing numbers of um, people who are, um, you know, interested in things like urban eco-villages and that sort of thing, where there's some sort of connection between neighbours that are stronger than we have. So Australia is, you know, the worst, but they're certainly pretty high up the list of countries with rampant individualism and, um, just, you know, the, I would suggest try and within your sphere of influence to change that, to, to help people to reassess, you know. None of us get by in life by ourselves, you know. Uh, it's all about the help we receive from others. Um, humans are such intensely social creatures. We're so ridiculously helpless when we're born and we stay that way for several years. There's, there's no reality to this sense that um, we achieve individually. So. Draw out the connections, draw out the, the ways that people cooperate instead of compete and try and, and um, just foster those as much as possible in the smallest ways that you can. Uh, even just helping people to think that there is such a thing as individualism versus and, co and, and competition versus cooperation and communalism gives a new lens to um, whatever um, activity you're involved with and you know whatever activity you are involved with it's within it's embedded within networks of people who are some in some way working together so I think it's vital and it's it's those deeper layers of values that uh, drive a, a huge number of the problems that we have and the problems that are only going to get worse um, in the next few decades <laughs>